Hello and welcome to the, the interview with our Alice Davis Hitchcock medallion shortlistee, Lucas Stanek. Lucas, um, it's very nice to see you and thank you for joining us uh, for this interview. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us who you are? Thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Łukasz Stanek and I'm an architectural historian at the University of Manchester. Well, your book is called Architecture in Global Socialism, Eastern Europe, West Africa and the Middle East in the Cold War. How did you come onto this topic and what is it, what is it about it that interests you? Well, uh, as it's the case, I suppose, with most complex projects, this book has many starting points. And one of them was my research about Nowa Huta, a socialist new town in post-war Poland, which I researched still as a student. And in so doing, I realized that the following project by the Design Institute, which was in charge of Nowa Huta, was the master plan of Baghdad in the 1960s. And you can see the master plan now on the image. Um, and uh, this was very intriguing to me. And uh, I suggested that topic uh, when I was invited to curate an, a small exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw in 2010. But uh, another uh, more conceptual starting point was an attempt at a different type of global history of architecture. The approach of my book goes beyond the dominant frameworks in which global architectural history has been developed so far. So on the one hand, um, post-colonial urbanism, which studies the consequences of the colonial encounter for the production and imagination of uh, urban spaces. And on the other hand, the world systems theory, which studies the diffusion of architecture from centers to peripheries. And in both approaches, um, the, 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 they, 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 they foreground uh, the agency of the West or the global North. And I was intrigued by a possibility of a different way of writing about architecture in a worldwide perspective, where the West or the North is still there for sure, but more as a background. Okay, well, this, this book took 10 years um, to prepare. And during this time, you visited archives in Germany, Poland, Russia, um, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Serbia, Croatia, Bulgaria, and Romania, uh, and that's only in Europe, uh, not to mention, um, archives in Accra, Lagos, Baghdad, Abu Dhabi, and Kuwait City. Now, this is um, rather overwhelming, and it's very impressive. How, how did you manage this, both in terms of organization and perhaps more fundamentally language skills? Um, yes, that's a, that's a great question, and I should clarify that I unfortunately didn't make it to Baghdad. Uh, but yes, this was, this was clearly a huge challenge. And uh, this challenge started with identifying and accessing archives in these regions. And I have very fond memories of waiting for days in various offices in Accra to be granted access to, to an, a very important archive, which is still used by a functioning uh, planning institution. Uh, but languages were, were a, a crucial challenge too. And uh, I could deal with a couple of Central European languages but I also worked extensively with research assistants. And uh, so a lot of material was translated from Arabic, but also from Hungarian and Romanian and so on. And this work with research assistants was really, really rewarding uh, with you know, very smart, very bright uh, young PhD students with MA uh, students. And I learned a lot from them. And actually this rapport continues. So they became sometimes collaborators and we are publishing together. So this uh, book is a single author uh, book, but uh, it has been really a bridge for me for a more, towards a more collaborative, a co-produced type of research. And I'm exploring this, this type of research in my current work. Well, that, that's nice. I think it's great to be able to uh, draw in other people, particularly young scholars, and give them an introduction to to do this sort of work and an opportunity to, to get their own um, scholarship published. Well, um, while limiting itself to the, the Cold War, this book focuses on a broad range of both cities and chronologies. Accra under Kume Nakuma, 
from 1957 to 1966. Lagos during the 1970s, Baghdad, uh, between the coup of 1958, which overthrew the monarchy, um, and the first Gulf War of 1990, and Abu Dhabi and Kuwait City in the final decades of the Cold War itself. What led you to the, these five very different places and times? Right. So all these five places were very important recipients of uh, architecture and planning and construction services from the Soviet Union and from other socialist countries. But in my preliminary research, I gathered a lot of materials about other cities. And so the decision about a selection uh, was really an important one, and it was based on a number of considerations. Uh, I wanted to show, firstly, the changing dynamics of these processes from the 1950s to the 1980s. And uh, in this time span, the um, 1970s with the oil crises, and the debt crisis that followed in Eastern Europe was a really important threshold. At the time from the 1970s, many socialist countries began to emphasize mercantile aims uh, rather than, let's say, Cold War geopolitics. And during those four decades, the motivations of Global South countries was also very diverse and evolving. And uh, this is represented by the case studies. And so a few countries, such as Ghana and um, Kwame Nkrumah, embarked on the socialist development path, supported by the Soviet Union. And you can see now an example of, of some of these uh, designs. Iraq, under the Ba'ath Party, also pursued a non-capitalist development, but it was very far from the Soviet model. Uh, by contrast, Nigeria, Kuwait, the UAE, uh, were not at all socialist countries, that were the, the elites were hostile towards things socialist, and they invited Eastern Europeans because of other reasons. For instance, in order to stimulate competition with uh, Western firms on the construction markets. And finally, a really important criterion for me in, in the selection of these five, five case studies was that neither of these countries was a Soviet satellite. And this also includes um, Ghana and Nkrumah, and I show in my book how Ghanaians had an upper hand in the negotiation of uh, Soviet housing neighborhoods in Accra, which you see now. Uh, and certainly none of uh, the other countries were Soviet satellites or Marxist-Leninist regimes. Rather, there were sort of nodes of intersection between various competing antagonistic networks in which uh, architecture was mobilized and circulated. And in that sense, they were kind of privileged points for study these networks comparatively. And, and this is really an explicit aim of the book. Yeah, thank you. You, you mentioned Ghana just now and uh, Nakuma. Ghana, then known as, as the Gold Coast, gained independence from Britain in 1957. Nigeria followed uh, very soon after in 1960. In, in discussing the influence of global socialism, as you call it, in, re in respectively um, Accra and Lagos, aren't you uh, talking about colonialism under another name? Okay, I understand that, that uh, what you mean is whether the Soviets became, became a new type of colonizing power. Yes. Yes. Well, um, you're right, this, con this, this concern was sometimes raised, for instance, by West Africans. Uh, for instance, in Nigeria, there was an important discussion about architectural education. Uh, in that country, in the course of the 1960s and the 1970s, many British uh, lecturers were replaced by Eastern Europeans. And accordingly, one Nigerian educator called this period semi-colonial. Uh, but this argument was refuted by others, in particular by Ekundayo Adeyemi, who was a Nigerian architect and scholar and dean of the Zaria School of Architecture. Adeyemi had no doubt that, that Nigerians were, were in charge, and you know, maybe he thought about his own experience, for sure he did. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the key arguments of the book is that uh, non-Soviet Eastern European actors were, if you like, weak actors. They had a lot to lose from the dissatisfaction of the Nigerian or Ghanaian 
or Iraqi commissioners. And this made a position often uncomfortable, but perhaps paradoxically also really impactful because they became highly instrumental in the execution of blueprints of modernization and development as conceived by local administrators and decision makers. Well, that's, um, how can I put it, that's possibly reassuring. The book, um, well, in the book, you argue that the mobility of architecture is best understood as the mobility of architectural labor and its various modalities, such as design, supervision, administration, research, and, and of course, education. The, there is nothing new in this, really. Um, I think of the Bauhaus which um, both staff and students, as well as the educational programs, um, moved fairly quickly to, to, um, to America, for instance. Alan Powers has written about that recently. Your book argues for the influence of global socialism and what you refer to as the post-colonial global South. But as you acknowledge, there were Western influences, such as the British architects Fry and Drew, who were already working in Ghana and Nigeria. So um, how did the, these two political spheres of influence, the global, so, uh, global socialism and the Western influence, how, how did they align themselves? Um, yes, this is really a, a crucial question. Uh, and you are, you are right, absolutely. My work is in conversation with other scholars who studied architectural labor, including Peggy Deemer or Katie Lloyd Thomas or Paul Jescott. But let me stress that the focus on architectural labor doesn't simply mean that these architects were you know, doing many things. Rather, uh, it means that when mobilized abroad, architectural labor was many things. And uh, it was something they needed to be that needed to be translated. It was something that needed to be adapted to the conditions on the ground but it was something also that needed to be exported. And it is in that latter modality, as exported, that the mobility of architectural labor from socialist country was defined by the political economy of foreign trade in state socialism. And this allows me to answer your question about what you call the two spheres of influence, or perhaps more fundamentally, really, the distinction between these two, or, or the question about the socialist character of the work of the protagonist of my book. And I have a twofold um, answer to this question. In some locations, such as Ghana and Nkrumah, architects from socialist countries and their Ghanaian counterparts were instrumental in implementing the socialist development path. And by the way, some of them didn't see that as that at all. They you know, considered it to be a professional experience even if their work was really part of that larger roadmap uh, led out by Kunkrumach's administration. But in other countries, uh, they were not at all busy with socialist development. As I mentioned before, that included Nigeria or, or the Gulf. These were not countries which participated in any sort of a socialist project. However, in all these locations, in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Iraq, and in the Gulf, uh, the labor of these architects from as exported from socialist countries, was consistently conditioned by the political economy of foreign trade in socialism. And I'm interested in how this political economy, economy impacted the work, but also the design, the programming, uh, the construction, the technology, the materiality of architecture. And for instance, I'm studying things like the inconvertibility of Eastern European currencies or the principle of Balter including, for instance, petrol barter, so the exchange of buildings for crude oil without the mediation of convertible currencies. And it were, it were, and I, I argue that it were such procedures rather than, you know, ideological debates that had a direct impact on their work on the ground. And I'm interested in the ways how Eastern Europeans, West Africans, Middle Easterners try to bypass the constraints of this political economy and how they try to benefit from its situated advantages. It sounds like a rather wonderful bartering system. <laughs> the, 
you know, the theme of uh, global socialism, which of course is the, the theme of your book, um, intrigues me. In the book, you introduce the concept of what you call socialist world making. And this is inspired by the writings of the Franco Martinique philosopher, poet, and literary critic, Edouard Glissant. This, um, this strikes me as being similar in, a, in its collectivist way to Glissant's concept of Atilanite, which stressed the creation of a specific West Indian identity out of a multiplicity of ethnic and cultural elements. Would you, would you agree that they are, in a sense, two sides of the same coin? I, I think that you are right uh, in the sense that uh, questions of collective identity were very much on the minds of the West African and the Middle Eastern protagonists of my book. These architects, thinkers, artists, and politicians were really concerned with the, con with the question and the construction of identities on a number of scales, from a municipal scale to, very importantly, a national one, but also larger ones, such as Pan-African or Pan-Arab. And like uh, Glissant's notion of uh, uh, antilianité, uh, they uh, were both these experiences were really grounded these projects of identities were really grounded on specific experiences and and lived realities but at the same time the consequences for cultural and political practices were inchoate and sort of at the horizon at best and uh, i believe that what is relevant for, for us as architectural historians in this story is that for these post independent elites uh architecture was really a useful and perhaps a privileged medium for thinking about these constructed uh, identities. And uh, I study a number of places in the book which I think would be would, would show this process. And for example, what you are looking at now, uh, uh, the International Trade Fair in Accra is one of them. Well, you know, this book really opens up our um, awareness of uh, developments in architecture in the um, third quarter of the 20th century in those parts of the world that I think we have um, we have ignored far too much and I think that it's a great achievement to have this book shortlisted for the Alice Davis Hitchcock medallion and I wish you um, every success but of course I, I have no idea who might be winning this in the end however um, there's going to be another book I hope uh, what will this be about where's your next project uh, well, I'm I'm lucky to be involved uh, with the uh, project uh, which is called Centering Africa at the Canadian Centre of Architecture in Montreal. And my contribution to this collective project is focused on uh, the questions of Africanization of Ghanaian architecture. That is to say, uh, the emergence and emancipation of indigenous actors in design, construction, planning, administration, and education in Ghana. And I do hope that this will become a book. Well, we will look forward to that. And um, thank you very much for talking to us. And as I say, good luck with this, um, this competition.